the title of my first talk is uh, non-invasive prenatal testing uh, with cell-free uh, DNA uh, screening. Now I'd like to start um, by talking about uh, trisomy 21 screening performance. So the performance trisomy of trisomy 21 screening tests are measured by their detection rates and screen positive rates. And the concept of screen positive rate is a very important one. And that's because women who screen positive are offered a choice of diagnostic uh, tests which carry a pregnancy loss risk. Uh, Non-invasive prenatal screening tests by cell-free DNA uh, offers a detection rate of greater than 99% for a screen positive rate of well under 1%. So that performance is clearly beyond what is on offer by the current best test, the combined first trimester screening, which offers a detection rate of around 90%. Uh, for a po uh, screen positive rate of around 3%. So on face value, this is a revolutionary improvement in trisomy 21 uh, screening. As you can see in the chart here, historically we have um, age used as a screening test where false positive rates were in the order of 30% for a detection rate of 40%. Uh, and today we're seeing a uh, screen positive rate of well less than 1% and detecting almost all cases of trisomy 21 uh, in, our, in our population. So you might ask, how is this possible? Well, the answer lies in the presence of cell-free DNA. Cell-free DNA is fragmented chromosome material uh, that circulates in the maternal bloodstream. Now, maternal cell-free DNA comes from cell lysis, uh, from placental apoptosis or break off of placental cells. Uh, that eventually mixes with the maternal blood circulation. Now, it has a very short half-life of approximately a quarter of an hour and practically undetectable two hours after birth, making it extremely useful for the current pregnancy with practically no risk of detecting an abnormality from a previous pregnancy. Now, the ability to identify DNA sequence uh, quickly and accurately by way of a technology known as massively par parallel sequencing has enabled cell-free DNA to be sequenced uh, deeply. Um, this results in the ability to identify the relative concentrations of cell-free DNA originating from each chromosome accurately. So therefore, if the concentration of cell-free DNA or broken up chromosome material uh, is above a certain threshold for chromosome 21, the result is assigned as a high probability for trisomy 21. Now, many studies to date have confirmed the high detection rates and extremely false positive rates of uh, non-invasive prenatal screening with cell-free DNA. And you can see from this clinical validity study uh, performed early uh, in the development of this uh, technique that uh, uh, there was a, a detection rate of practically 100% for trisomy 21 cases and a false positive rate of 0.1 to 0.3%. Uh, now, this particular study looked at all uh, women who uh, were screened high risk, really, from conventional screening. So it was a select pop population. Now, in the subsequent average population studies done in the US, uh, mainly, uh, this confirmed the high uh, detection rates for trisomy 21 with extremely low false positive rates of less than, way less than 1%. And in Australia, uh, just five months ago, the ENSJOG uh, published a paper of uh, 5,000 screened in an unselected population study that showed a detection rate of 100% for trisomy 21 and trisomy 13 and uh, close to 90% for trisomy 18 for a false positive rate of less than 1%. So NIPT therefore carries an extremely high sensitivity it detects almost all cases of trisomy 21 with an extremely low false positive rate, dramatically reducing the number of uh, invasive tests that are necessary, thereby reducing procedure-related miscarriage risk. However, it is not a diagnostic test. This is because the positive predictive value of this test is not at diagnostic test levels. Additionally, it does not provide information on the fetal anatomy at all. And that's the single most important uh, downfall uh, of using uh, NIPT screening uh, without uh, ultrasound. So therefore, it is not recommended to not be used without ultrasound. 
Consequently, it cannot be considered as a direct replacement for the ultrasound component of combined first trimester screening uh, for trisomy 21. Now, just to illustrate the point, the fact that it's got uh, predict positive predictive value that is uh, less than diagnostic tests rates, uh, let's for a moment hypothesize the um, the prevalence of trisomy 21 in our population of approximately 1 in 500 or 2 in 1000 and let's just assume that NIPT carries a test accuracy of 99% or practically 100% uh, for a 0.5% false positive rate. Therefore in 1000 women who in the un unselected population uh, in our community we know that two will have trisomy 21 who will be corrected correctly uh, tested with a high-risk NIPT test, but we also know that given a 0.5% false positive rate, that three others will uh, have a, a positive or high-risk screening test, but will not have trisomy 21. Now, therefore, the positive predictive value is 2 in 5, which is 40%. So this is truly, uh, clearly not at diagnostic test levels. Now, NIPT was um, was a, a test that was uh, developed very much commercially in the private sector and therefore it made uh, our screening seen very much uh, by storm and there was uh, hardly any consensus statements uh, available uh, by professional societies uh, uh, and bodies initially when it first became available in 2011. But since then, we have seen the emergence of several guidelines and consensus statements by professional societies as to how it should be used. used. Um, but I, want, I just want to draw your attention to the ISUOG statement, which is the International Society in Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, and they have uh, uh, recommended that all women who have cell-free DNA screening be offered a uh, first trimester ultrasound to cover screening for fetal anomalies and that pre-test counseling is absolutely essential uh, to discuss the limitations of this test and the fact that it is not a diagnostic test and therefore confirmatory CVS or coronary villus sampling and amniocentesis is required in light of a positive or high-risk uh, NIPT test and non-invasive prenatal testing uh, has not been evaluated in low-risk populations and that NIPT may be used if a combined first trimester screening is considered not reassuring. And in the presence of fetal structural anomalies, invasive testing is recommended regardless of a low-risk NIPT result because effectively NIPT is useful really for trisomy 21 and not the other chromosomes. So the question still begs, how do you incorporate non-invasive prenatal screening into your practice? Now I'd like to propose uh, two methods. Uh, firstly, as a primary screening test, that is to use the uh, cell-free DNA as a primary screening test, the first line screening test for Down, Down syndrome, but also perform, perform a first trimester ultrasound to screen uh, for structural anomalies. This is uh, I guess the full three course meal option where all the options are ticked to get the best test for trisomy 21 screening and the best test for screening for early fetal structural anomalies. Secondly, NIPT can be used as a contingent screening test. Uh, that is to say that the first line uh, offered is still the combined first trimester sc screening consisting of maternal serum screening and ultrasound for all women and only use NIPT if there is a non-reassuring or intermediate risk on combined first trimester screening. This is sort of like a, a have dessert if hungry option, go for the two course meal and if the second course is not satisfying, go for the third course. So really, uh, this form of screening divides the combined first trimester screening from its conventional uh, two-tier low-risk, high-risk uh, result to a three-tier low-risk, intermediate-risk and high-risk result. And how do we use this? Now, if NIPT were to be used as a primary screening test, all women would be offered cell-free DNA blood test at 10 weeks gestation, and they all would also be offered a 12 to 14-week 
uh, ultrasound to screen for fetal structural anomalies. That way they got both bases covered. Now, if the woman has a, no a normal NIPT or low risk and a normal ultrasound, no further testing is offered. However, if NIPT comes back as high risk, which is uh, uh, proposed to be about 0.5% of our population, they, these women are offered CVS or amniocentesis for confirmatory testing. Uh, and if they are low risk, but at the 12-week ultrasound show a structural abnormality, they are also offered CVS or amniocentesis to diagnose or exclude um, minor or atypical chromosome abnormalities. However, we do know that a, a proportion, a small proportion of women who are uh, who we intend to have cell-free DNA testing will have no result uh, due to the fact that they have a very small uh, concentration of fetal cell-free DNA in their bloodstream. And if that's the case, they can then uh, go fall back on having the combined first trimester screening test uh, using it conventionally. And if they are considered high risk, they go on to be offered CVS or amniocentesis. Or if they're at low risk, uh, no further testing is offered. Now this form uh, of screening, if you like, would increase the detection rate of trisomy 21 to practically 100% and reduce the invasive testing rate easily by 90% due to the fact that um, we are correctly identifying most cases of trisomy 21 with a very, very low false positive rate. Now, second form is to, uh, the second technique or second option is to offer NIPT as a contingent screening test so in contingent screening, all women are offered the combined first trimester screening with ultrasound and maternal serum screening in the conventional way. Now, the risks are assigned three ways, low, intermediate, and high risk. Now, because we're allocating three risk groups, we can afford now to have a much higher reassurance for women who are considered low risk. For instance, let's take less than one in 1,000 risk as the women who are allocated low risk. No further testing is offered, and it is estimated that approximately 87% will fall in this category. And would would only offer invasive testing if the combined first trimester screening comes in at a very, very high risk, such as 1 in 10, to increase the pickup rate of major chromosome abnormality there, or trisomy 21. And it is estimated that approximately half a percent of women will fall into this category. And approximately 13% of women will fall in the intermediate risk group, the non-reassuring risk group, um, and these women are then offered NIPT, and if NIPT assigns low risk, no further testing is offered, and if NIPT is high risk, further testing is then offered. Now this model has the potential to increase detection rate of trisomy 21 markedly as well, probably 98, 99%, and also reduce invasive testing, but the, the, the main difference compared to the uh, NIPT as a primary screening test is that it is much less costly for our population because only 13% of women uh, will have to foot out the bill uh, of paying for NIPT as opposed to 100% of women. So now then, how does NIPT fit in the timetable of the pregnancy? Now we know that CVS is available after 11 weeks gestation and amniocentesis is available from 15 weeks onwards. That's not going to change. If uh, And currently, our current screening program uh, mainly involves combined first trimester screening, which offers a maternal serum screening blood test from 10 weeks to 13 weeks onwards, and ultrasounds offered between 11 weeks and 13 and a half weeks to get a combined screening score, and the mid-trimester ultrasound offered from 19 weeks onwards. Now, if NIPT were to be offered as a contingent screening test, that would come after the first trimester combined screening. If it's uh, an intermediate risk, women are offered uh, NIPT as a contingent screen, and if they're high risk, go on to have amniocentesis or CVS. Now, if we were to offer NIPT as a primary screening test, uh, the result for trisomy 21 screening would come very much earlier in the first trimester, allow, enabling uh, women to have ultrasounds for first trimester anatomy survey, um, from sort of 11 uh, 12 weeks onwards and ultrasound from uh, 19 weeks onwards. But since we already know about the risk of trisomy 21, we would propose that to get a better view of the anatomy, that the 
first trimester ultrasound is moved to somewhere between 12 and a half and 14 weeks and that the second trimester ultrasound uh, can be delayed to somewhere between 20 and 21 and a half weeks to give us better views. Now, in conclusion then, uh, I'd just like to point out that NIPT is a very, very highly accurate screening test for trisomy 21, not so good for trisomy 13 and trisomy 18. It is the best available trisomy 21 screening test. However, and I'd like to stress this, it is not a replacement for the first trimester ultrasound and therefore a 12 to 14 week ultrasound is clearly still indicated for the best screening program uh, for pregnant women uh, in terms of trisomy 21 screening and structural anomaly screening and that there are two ways if, of incorporating NIPT into your practice firstly by way of a primary screening test and secondly by way of a contingent screening test. Now I'd just like to illustrate the point that um, NIPT is not a direct replacement for the first trimester ultrasound with this last slide um, just by showing you some of the abnormalities that can uh, potentially be picked up by the first trimester ultrasound. And this first image here, this is a fetus with a crania, uh, which is where the cranium has not formed. And you can see there's no cranial vault here with an abnormally shaped uh, head uh, in the fetus. This is a fetus which has a, a major intracranial abnormality of fusion of the midline and therefore creating a, a monoventricle in a condition called holoprosencephaly. This is a fetus with a major anterior abdominal wall defect and on phallocele. This is a fetus that has uh, uh, an, uh, really what's called uh, a limb body wall complex abnormality which is really resultant from amnion rupture sequence where limbs can be missing, large anterior abdominal wall defects, scoliosis, uh, clefts, facial clefts, and amniotic band type slash defects can be seen in the fetus, uh, an imminently lethal condition. And fetuses with major heart abnormalities such as a hypoplastic left heart syndrome are seen in this fetus at 13 weeks. A fetus with a megacystis or a massively dilated bladder. A fetus that has a skeletal, skeletal dysplasia or severe dwarfism, if you like, uh, this being a lethal form of thanatophoric dysplasia. And finally, a fetus that has hydrops, which is really an end-stage um, condition of many, many types of conditions. So here in this page alone, you can see eight conditions that are actually almost always lethal, uh, and this can all most always be picked up in the first trimester. So by not offering the first trimester ultrasound, uh, when NIPT has been done is really only um, um, seeing a, a, the tip of the iceberg, if you like, in terms of first trimester screening. Thank you very much for your attention.